Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for podcasters by podcasters. Podcasting Smarter is the official podcast from Podbean, featuring podcasting interviews, best practices, and helpful tips. We're here to give you the tools, resources, product updates, and news to help you get started podcasting and keep your podcast growing. Hello, and welcome to Podcasting Smarter. This is Norma Jean Belenke, Podbean's Head of Events. And in today's episode, we'll be having a conversation with Helen Fospero, a veteran journalist and host of Convex Conversations, where we'll get into branded podcasts, how her journalism background has helped her share stories, and what she's learned along the way. Stay tuned, and here we go. Hi, Helen. How's it going? Good morning. How are you? Good. Good afternoon. We are so excited that you're here on Podcasting Smarter, Podbean's official podcast, because you have this big journalism background and you're creating this incredible podcast. So it's really like such an incredible moment where your experience in the industry is meeting each other and the work you're doing is incredible. We're just so excited to have you here today. Gosh, what an introduction. That's so kind. I'm going to let you into a secret. I've never guested on a podcast. So this is new for me. Oh, we're here first. Well, I'm so glad. What a privilege. (laughs) So for everybody out there, tell us a little bit about your background because you have such an extensive background and really seasoned, beautiful career in journalism and broadcasting. Oh, I love that word seasoned. And a veteran made me laugh, actually. That makes me feel very old. But I have been in journalism. Well, if I'm honest with you, I've been in journalism since the age of 14 because My father was a a regional journalist for 46 years, and my first job at school was a tea girl in his newspaper office. So I've been surrounded by reporters and journalism all my life, really. And I started in the business when I was 17, started in newspapers, and quickly and accidentally fell into television. And that's where the main area of my career has been. I've worked for all of Britain's main broadcasters for the BBC, ITV, Sky News, mainly in the news arena. So at Sky, it was 24-hour breaking news. And yeah, I think the thing that attracted me in the first place was people. My dad was a massive people person and loved everybody's stories. And it didn't matter where they were from, who they are, whether they're famous, whether they're politicians, whether it's the man you, or woman you chat to at the bus stop he gave me that love of storytelling. And that's why I think doing the convex conversation has appealed so massively to me because it is interesting and inspirational people's life stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I want to talk a little bit about now about the show and convex conversation. Tell everyone out there listening about the show because it's so unique. Obviously it's brought to the world by Convex, which is an insurance company. So tell us a little bit about that, the journey of it getting started and and about the show, because it has such a specific tone and it's it's just such beautiful work. Oh, that's so nice of you to say. Well, it started with a conversation with Ashley Stockwell, who is Chief Marketing Officer at Convex. And Convex is a relatively new insurance company, started a few years ago by a man who was in insurance all his life and sold his company and retired and then was persuaded to start again in his 60s. And Ash is somebody we've known for a very long time. He used to work for Richard Branson at Virgin and invited me in for a coffee and said that he was looking into the idea of buying in a podcast so that he could entertain and inspire his staff, a lot of whom are are young and, uh, you know, Gen Y, on their way into work on a Monday morning. And then it occurred to him that perhaps Convex should do their own. And what did I think? And would I be interested in putting some ideas forward and perhaps doing a six-part special to see, you know, what, what was involved and where we could go with it? Originally, the idea was to feature CEOs, and quickly over that coffee, I said, well, look, I don't know that many CEOs, but I do know a lot of really interesting, inspirational people, friends, people who I've known throughout my career, my contacts book. I suppose you don't realize after all these years in journalism, your contact book's quite strong, although I never really think of it like that, but I do know a lot of people. So we decided to start it off with the leader of the Red Arrows, who you may know because they're the iconic 
uh, Royal Air Force's aerobatic display team, and I've done some filming work with them. So I thought that was a good place to start. Another great friend of mine is a blind adventurer and TV presenter, Amal Latif. He was told when he went blind at 18 that he would never go to university to study maths because he was blind. He would never go on his gap year abroad because he's blind, and he certainly wouldn't become an accountant. He went to university, studied maths, went to Canada on his gap year, and not only became an accountant, but became a corporate head of finance. He's now very well known here on television. He won a show called uh, MasterChef. Celebrity Master Chef. He got to the semi-finals and he can't see at all. So he's incredible. So I thought, well, he would be good to talk to. So we did six episodes with interesting people that I know, including the then CEO of Convex, Stephen Catlin. And it's just gone on from there, Norma Jean. We're now on episode, I think, 110 or something like that. And it's been fantastic. I've enjoyed every minute of it and really looking forward to what 2023 holds for us. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something where you've passed that 100 episode mark, which is huge for any podcast. And just with with that in mind, what would you tell yourself now if you went back to the beginning? When I went back to the beginning, I think there was a naivety in setting it up, which is actually quite beautiful. And I'm not sure I would tell myself anymore. I've enjoyed the journey. And the idea at the beginning was to go out in person and interview everybody. So we bought a very good quality sound kit, just a little Zoom box and great headphones and good uh, Shure microphones, which have we found to be really, really excellent quality. Coming from television, I wanted it to be great quality. I didn't want to sacrifice anything, you know, recording on poor microphones or anything like that. So we bought a kit and the idea is that I would head out um, with a sound person and record them in person. And then, of course, lockdown happened very quickly, just after we'd started the podcast. So we had to quickly learn to do them remotely. And if you remember, pre-pandemic, we weren't all Zooming and on Teams calls and all that kind of thing. So now it feels second nature to us, and it's easy, and the technology is easy. But at the time, we hadn't done that kind of thing. So it was you know, a real learning curve, finding out what audio worked, what software worked, we discovered Riverside, which is, I suppose, like a Zoom, but specialized in audio. So when we record our remote interviews, the sound of the guest is actually recorded locally and then sent to us over the internet. So in the early days, there was internet interference sometimes and we'd have to start the question again. So I don't know whether I'd do anything different, really, because the the learning curve was really interesting. And the other thing I like about it is the variety of guests that it just seems to evolve who we do. And I think if you keep an open mind when you're thinking about guests, you end up having some extraordinary adventures. So, for example, the podcast has taken me to the Outer Hebrides where we've met a TikTok star, a Hebridean baker who grew up in a village with 30 people and is now an internet sensation because during the pandemic he started posting Little videos have been making ancient Scottish recipes and showing the beautiful scenery in the Outer Hebrides. It, we ended up in Kenya recording three podcasts with conservationists, people like um, Simpson Urikob, who spent his whole life dedicated to saving the rhino. So it's, it's been... Oh, I'll start that again. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, honestly, it's something where when you're starting and you have that little seed, you don't think about all the places that your podcast can take you. And just for everyone out there listening, the Hebrides are, it's an archipelago of islands in Scotland. It's <laughs> so very it's, remote. <laughs> it's very, very remote. And so it's something where, you know, this podcast really has taken you places, literally. And I want to talk a little bit more about production and the team and what goes into it and and all of that. But I also want to go back because Convex really has been a partner for you guys as well. And what value have they seen from a branding and a human interest perspective? Because like you mentioned, you know, the the idea of the podcast was really for employees to feel inspired, to have something, you know, motivating and exciting and positive to listen to on a Monday morning. But this this podcast has really kind of grown into something entirely different in such a good way. So what have they also said about it? 
Oh, well, they absolutely love it and have been really supportive. And at the end of the first year, we realized we'd done 52 convex conversations. So they came up with the idea of making a book of those 52 conversations. And that's something they've given to their contacts and their clients. And when you flick through that book, we've now just brought out our second, which I think is a lot better than, even better than the first, because because I was more focused on the content and seeking good content to put in the book. But that's a really lovely thing for them to give to contacts and and clients and um, brokers. And it gives Convex a really lovely connection with all sorts of interesting people around the world. And what's been great for them as well, that some of the Convex conversations are inspired by people they know and members of staff. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Eid Al-Jazali is a young Syrian refugee and he fled the war in Syria and almost died trying to get to the UK. He spent all his money, all the money his family could put together to pay you know, intermediaries to put him on a boat and head out in the sea in the dark. And his journey is extraordinary. But the bit of the journey that um, I'll share with you on the, the your podcast is that he was in a wooden boat with packed with refugees, quite a small wooden boat in the middle of the night trying to get across to Greece. And he's a non-swimmer, never been able to swim in his life. And in the, it chokes me off actually, in the middle of the night, there was a massive storm and the wooden boat broke into pieces. Mm. And Ede spent two and a half, three hours in the sea, in the freezing waters, clinging onto a piece of wood, just hoping to be rescued. They were very lucky a ship came by rescued them and to cut a very, very long story short, he ended up in Scotland living on five pounds a day and at some stages homeless. Anyway, he ended up becoming a convex intern and then going to his local swimming pool at 6.30 in the morning and just observing a swimming club. And one day the instructor noticed him and said, look, why why do you come here every day to watch the swimming club? And he said, "I, I want to learn to swim. And he told his story and he said, but I'm living on not very much. Anyway, he's now training for the Olympic refugee team and is an extraordinary swimmer and a fantastic young man and has done several internships with Convex. So the podcast has been great sometimes to feature Convex's own. And also they give a lot of money every year to Alzheimer's Research UK and they champion various Alzheimer's charities who are seeking to find better treatments and cures. So we featured through Convex brilliant scientists at the cutting edge of research who are trying to diagnose the condition 20 years before symptoms even show. And on another sort of connected part to that, we interviewed Formula One legend Sir Jackie Stewart, whose wife Helen is suffering badly from dementia. And a very famous actor here, Vicky McClure, who if you Um, watch British television. She's the star of Line of Duty. And she has her own dementia choir, which has been featured on BBC One. So when we interviewed Vicky, that was another interesting area of questioning that really appealed to Convex. So they contribute as well to this whole process enormously. And when the book came out this Christmas, the Christmas that's just gone, and we flicked through it, it just made me smile because you know, we do a podcast every week and there's not often time to sit back and plan who we're going to do. It it just is an ever-evolving um, project. And it was nice to just sit back and think, gosh, the the diversity and the different stories and the countries that are represented in there are incredible. So I'm massively proud of it and I'm very protective of it and I love it. And it's just me and a very tiny team that put it together. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that, you know, not only are you able to showcase inspiring people and stories for the Convex team, but you're able to feature those stories from within the Convex team. That's incredible, number one. And then number two, to shed a spotlight on, to shed light on a cause that's so important to Convex because companies do have specific initiatives and specific causes that they care about and that they back, you know, and that they they help out. And so I think hearing that research and knowing, you know, that the work that people do goes into that as well is so important. Yeah, it's really important. We interviewed, um, when the Black Lives Matter rallies were taking place in London, there was uh, a black guy called Patrick Hutchinson, who was photographed saving a a far-right white 
protester's life. He was he threw him over his shoulder and the protester, I think, would have probably been trampled or beaten to death. And Patrick saved him and he went on to win the humanitarian award and to set up a charity, United to Change and Inspire. And when we were doing, we actually did a, a live podcast after we did the recorded one. We did another one for Convex staff with another guest. And we quickly realized that Patrick was using an old iPad and he was just setting up a charity and we said, you know, do you have a laptop? And he said, oh, no, 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 I haven't got one. And Convex bought him one and gave him one as a thank you for doing it. And so they're really kind and they support causes in a small way and also with Alzheimer's Research UK in a massive way. They're I suppose this is why they wanted the podcast for their staff. That you know, the original idea was, let's give them something great to listen to and inspire them on a Monday morning. So they're a fantastic company to work for, and you know, I've I've really really enjoyed the last two years. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit more about the production of your show. How big is the team, you know, and how did you build that team out from an initial coffee <laughs> of an idea of a podcast? This is how all podcasts start, right? It's like you have an idea. It's tiny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, this could be a podcast. We could have six episodes and um, things really do blossom from there. So I, I know that you do work with an incredible team. So tell us a little bit about that and, and how that was built out. Well, I work very closely with my husband, who's uh, a New Yorker and a journalist by trade and producer and maker of corporate films. And so it started off, particularly when we were in lockdown, we were under my son's bunk bed. <laughs> by the way, we weren't low down under my son's bunk bed. That's where we created our studio. He's got one of those high bunk beds with a desk underneath. Yeah, so yeah. we weren't lying on the floor under his bunk bed. But uh, when we record remotely, that's recorded with Carl doing all the technical side. And then when I'm out and about, uh, I use a team of freelance sound people. So I can do the sound myself. I did the sound myself in Kenya. You know, some people might say it's not that difficult, but when you're trying to focus on your guest and the interview, the last thing I want to be worried about is, is this actually recording? But uh, in Kenya, I did it myself. But as I said, much, I much prefer to concentrate on the content and listen to the guest. And then editing wise, again, small team of freelance editors who, you know, sometimes Carl edits and other times we you know, need to farm it out because obviously once a week is, is a lot. And we do pride ourselves in a polished end result. We don't take any personality out of it, but, but we do take a lot of ums and ers or coughs and splutters out. And apart from that, we keep it really simple. The, the thing I really enjoy is that there are no adverts in our podcast. So it is straight 45 minutes of chat. And nine times out of 10, it's pretty much as we've recorded it. And if you listen to the original recording and then the finished one, you perhaps wouldn't notice any difference. But if I look at the edit screen, I can see perhaps 700 edits. And those edits will just be breaths and ums and ers and just cleaning it up so we do do a quite extensive edit on the podcast in terms of you know eqing it and just making sure the quality is really really good and also we've got more adventurous with it depending on who we're doing we featured some musicians so for example we did a podcast with the art director of the last five Bond movies, Neil Callow. Yes. And that was around the time when it was the Bond's 60th anniversary. So they just released a CD of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra playing all the Bond tunes. So we put a lot of music in that one. And his was an interesting one, actually, how we got him. Because for years in the summertime and sometimes winter, I've gone to a little village in Austria called Solden to either hike in the mountains or to do a little bit of skiing if I get chance. And Solden is where Spectre, a lot of the chase scenes in Spectre were filmed. And the owner of the ski resort, you know, Bond were throwing millions at him saying, we want you to close the resort and we want to film Spectre here. And he said, I, you know, I don't really want any of that. But what I would like is to open the world's first ever installation dedicated to 007 and what I need is your support with that so for a few years now I've watched the 007 elements being built and I've looked around it a couple of times and I was there last year and said to to Jacob who runs the resort actually I think it'd be great to do a podcast on the museum 
And then he said, well, actually, then Neil Callow, the art director of all the films that Daniel Craig starred in, he helped with the museum and we should get him. So Jack flew to London and Neil Callow lives in London. And that was our final podcast 52 in the latest book uh, was an image from the museum of a small aircraft smashing through a plate glass window which is what happens in Spectre. So that was really exciting for me because I'm a bit of a 007 nerd, it has to be said. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, listening to the episode, you have the music, which is great. So for everybody out there, in terms of permissions, it's it's huge to get this music. Like, it's a really big deal. (laughs) Yes, it is. And people have been very kind on that front. The other one that we had to ask permission to use was, um, well, he's the Prince of Wales now, Prince William, as he was when I interviewed him. I'm involved in Tusk, a conservation charity who for the last 30 years have made a massive difference in Africa. And I was at the Tusk Awards, nothing to do with the podcast that night. I was making an hour long program behind the scenes interviewing the winners of the awards and lucky enough to interview Prince William. He had given his award to the man I mentioned earlier, Simpson Yurikob, who actually is from Namibia and has dedicated 30 years of his life to saving the black rhino population in Namibia. And as part of this hour-long television program I was making, I got an interview with Prince William. So then I went home and I I kept thinking about Simpson. I'd shaken his hands with both hands. I felt really quite overwhelmed when I spoke to him. I looked at him and thought, gosh, his life is so different to mine. He's given up time with his family and his children to go out there and to do incredible things in the in wildlife and in conservation and so we recorded a podcast with him where he was actually back in Namibia and trying to track him down when he's out rhino tracking was quite tricky but we found him we did a podcast and then the uh, Kensington Palace were very kind and Tusk and said look if you want to you can incorporate some of your interview with William so that was a really special moment too and it's one of the only times in my 30 years of journalism I must say when he was about to walk in I could just feel butterflies the size of bats in my stomach <laughs> I was so worried about forgetting to say the right thing you know it's it's good evening your royal highness and then you call him sir and I was worried I might forget my questions and um but he was actually really smashing and very down to earth yeah absolutely you guys have had some incredible audio on the podcast I mean even I believe also I think there's a quote from I think there's like David Attenborough you also have audio from David Attenborough on the show as well yeah, we do. David Attenborough is a big supporter of Tusk and uh, he's involved in the awards. So we have some from him. I haven't interviewed David Attenborough. He'd be very high up on on the wish list. On the wish um, But yes, to hear his dulcet tones in our podcast was nice. Also, when we did The Racing Legend, Sir Jackie Stewart, we did a two-part special with him and we used some old audio from the 1960s and 70s from his racing days. So we do like where we can to add some interest and and put some different audio in. And again, it's quite time consuming, but I I like the podcast to be textured. Sometimes it's just a straight chat and other times it cries out for different audio, which is great for me to put in. I think as well, the other thing I really like about it is the fact it is audio only. I know a lot of podcasters film their podcasts, but for me, having come from a television background, there's something really special about audio only. I think it's more intimate. And I think when you're interviewing people, particularly on difficult subjects, sometimes the fact they know they're not being recorded. We did a podcast with a 10-year-old, amazing girl called Betsy Rose Powley, who became a social media star here because she started sharing and documenting her battle with a really rare form of cancer, E-wing sarcoma. She had a tumor which was 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters in her chest and it had moved her heart to the wrong side of the body and collapsed the lung. And she's had a year of grueling chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but is the most incredible little girl I've ever met. Actually, she would have probably been very happy. She's quite a quite a star on camera and she'd have been quite happy for it to be filmed. So she's probably not the best example of it. But I find it much easier when it's when it's words and it's audio and and it's quite pleasant for me that having spent so many years, you know, in TV, kind of worried what you look like and had to wear the right thing. And I just like the fact I can tip up in my jeans and a, a hoodie and 
sat on the floor or wherever if I'm with Betsy we sat on the floor and recorded hours and it just feels so much more relaxed and I think the guests really enjoy that too. Absolutely. And, you know, we talk about this all the time at Podbean. The device that people listen to your podcast on is the device that they call their moms on, that they call their kids on, you know, that they're talking to their families on. So podcasting is so intimate because, you know, there's that there's that intimacy of, you know, you're using the same device as you would a phone, right? But then also there's that intimacy where it's interactive because when you don't see something, your mind fills in the gaps. And so it's participatory in that way. Your audience is going to join in on creating that experience for themselves. But also if you and I were heading off now for a cup of coffee, we'd sit there and chat about everything under the sun in a really relaxed, normal style. But if somebody came along and suddenly started recording us or you know, even on their phone, you, you suddenly, you, you guards up a little bit. And even if you're a TV presenter, you, it would still feel like, oh, that feels slightly uncomfortable. So it is really nice that I want it to feel like the title suggests it's a conversation. And, you know, I think the other big thing, which I haven't done very much of today because I've rattled on, is is the listening aspect of it. Not to be afraid sometimes of a little bit of silence on the podcast and just listen. Somebody's telling you something emotional or, you know, we interviewed um, a chap in Britain who's, again, very famous here, the Reverend Richard Coles. He was in the Communards, the band in the 80s and became a vicar and led a very colourful life. And when we did his podcast, his 40-year-old partner had recently passed away. So Mm. naturally, we started the podcast talking a little bit about David, his partner, and, and how Richard was holding up. And in fact, the audio was so emotional and raw that we entered it in one of the categories for a podcast awards recently. Um, We were shortlisted for it, actually. But it was all about listening. And Richard said he was standing up and facing forwards. And it was just important not to jump in and to let those thoughts unravel. And when we were putting clips together for the shortlist for for the awards, I listened back to that and it just completely choked me up and and I was really pleased that I had just listened because in again in TV the temptations to jump in and fill the gap and sometimes on the podcast there's no need to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Leaving room for that human emotion and cuz you don't know what's going to come out of a person's mouth. You think you do. I think we all do in the in the age of social <laughs> media and smartphones and all this stuff and and sometimes the art of of listening and you know leaving that space for anything you know that infinite possibility is so important as well i was going to say they they're well you know they're well researched i spend a lot of time reading up background reading and and i walk into every interview with an intro and an outro and probably three or four pages of just rough drafted questions a bit like you i think it all through and i have a structure but it's again, it's about listening and, and willing to mix and match with that structure because you never know what's going to come out first and where that's going to take you. And and you can miss a real gem if you don't listen to the answer and you just plow on with, you know, question number two. Uh, so that come, I suppose it comes naturally to me because I've been in the industry for a very long time. But I still have my security blankets and I, yeah, I could walk in with, with no prep and, and have a lovely conversation. And I'm sure it would be fine but for me it's all about prep 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 and it was the same in breakfast television three nights the three hours the night before I'd be prepping writing myself little you know cue cards so that I'd thought of some questions and then you get into the studio and when it's all live and it's all happening around you or news is breaking or guests change you feel like you've already put a lot of legwork and thought in so that brings a sense of of calm and and allows you to tackle whatever happens so for example on breakfast tv if you've got a big breaking story and then you're interviewing a guest you're expecting you might in the break just look down at that little cue card and think oh yes I was going to ask him about x y and z or yes this is the guest who did x y and z and all that tv prep has really helped me I think in the podcast world Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I wanted to ask you kind of what you had gleaned from your seasoned, as we said earlier, (laughs) seasoned veteran Mm -hmm. career as a journalist. But it is something where, you know, you have those decades of experience and they're valuable and you've learned a lot and there's wisdom there. 
that's precious. And so it's something where just having, I think even tips like that, right? Being super prepared, but also being flexible. I think that's super important for everybody out there listening, you know, because a lot of the time we think if you're super prepared, maybe you have to follow everything to a T or if, if you take things a little bit more flexible or casual in the tone of your show, maybe you don't have to prepare, but it can be both. And sometimes that gives you the best of both worlds because you're ready for anything, but you're also flexible and present in the moment. Yeah. I think for me being people on morning TV here, I was on a show for a long time that went to air at six in the morning and finished about 9 30 sometimes in the role as a correspondent but often anchoring on the sofa and people said when I was on the sofa you look always look so calm and relaxed which obviously you know when you're broadcasting in people's living rooms in the morning when they've got the pajamas and nighties on and they're running around trying to get the kids to school you don't want anybody a bit stressy pants on the sofa in the morning you want somebody calm and warm and relaxed and I suppose you, the idea is you, you know, you, you look like a swan on the top, but you're sort of paddling away underneath. But the way I always dealt with that was the preparation. And for the podcast, it's about doing the guests the, the honor of finding out about them and doing some background reading. And for me, that doesn't work to have a prep call. Some guests say, oh, do you want a prep call? But I find that if you and I had had a prep call for this and you'd been asking me the questions that you're now asking me, my answers now wouldn't be the same because I'd feel, oh, I've already told Norma Jean that. And so also that applies when I arrive and meet a guest. I'm very careful and always brief. If I have got somebody with me on sound, always brief them. Please don't ask the key questions. Because if you walk in before you're recording and you start asking some of the questions you're then going to ask in your interview, I find you never get the the best answer. It's It's better to talk about other things that aren't part of the podcast. But yeah, for me, it's about really reading up on the guest. And if it's somebody who isn't very well known or, or there isn't much out there, ask, ask them to send you a few links or, or look at their Instagram. We're interviewing a climber next week who does free climbing and she sets routes in places like Greenland where there'll be walls of rock. I'm talking about vertical, sheer walls of rock that have never been climbed before. And she helps lay the roots for other free climbers. She's absolutely extraordinary. She's early 30s. And I just discovered her on Instagram by watching her films, thinking I need to meet this woman. She's absolutely incredible. And the amount of material I've gleaned from her Instagram and just flicking back on her posts is extraordinary. Uh, the other thing we do, just thinking about her, is there's some incredible footage of her climbing on her Instagram. And again, I am a visual person, much as I love audio. So what we also started doing when we had time in the pandemic, actually, when all my other work disappeared, so we were 100% focused on the podcast and having that time to, to develop it, we started cutting sort of 59 second promo clips and at the beginning they were audio with a photograph and a quote and then depending on who we got suddenly it was like hang on a second we've got some great footage here so the climber's minute promo will feature her climbing so that's something else I suppose that we've learned on our journey that we didn't do from the beginning and that each as each month goes by, we get more ambitious with and and it you know it takes time sometimes to to find that footage and to get permission to use it. But when you see the podcast with Hazel Findlay, if you see the promo, that also will help bring the whole thing to life. Yeah, absolutely. And add perspective. That's such an important aspect, you know, because guests are varied, right? <laughs> <And> <laughs> depending on your po- every podcaster out there knows that. And we've had live streams you know, in live events and episodes talking about how to book a celebrity, but not every guest is going to be a celebrity. And we've also had a lot of hosts say, you know, some of the guests that are the most well-known, that may not be your most popular episode because those really well-known guests maybe aren't going to cross promo or share the episode because they're doing heaps of podcasts or they've got a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. It's, It's important to kind of, you know, dig into the world of your guest as well. And you've dug, you really dug into some worlds. So I want to ask you about your favorite episodes because this podcast literally took you from England to Africa, (laughs) which is (laughs) so unbelievably cool. You're like out in safari, you know, with a mic stand and a boom, just (laughs) recording podcasts. Love it. Uh, 
that trip to Africa was, I've never been to Africa and I think in my heart of hearts, I'm an Africa file. I knew I was going to fall in love with it. So to get the opportunity to go to Kenya for, it was actually three days. Can you believe that? Wow. Three days, three podcasts, two overnight flights four or five game drives. And when I got out there, what I didn't really realize, I went with a company called 91, who are an investment firm here. And they had entered a team into the Lewa Marathon, which Tusk organizes every year to raise money. And the money that it raises from the marathon, it uses to, well, help build conservancies to protect wildlife, but it's also to help communities and to help them survive and have clean water and good education and they build schools and things like that. So I went out with Emily, who's head of events at 91 and Tusk, and one of the podcasts was following her team. Now that was a challenge, let me tell you, audio wise, when you're trying to capture I think I focused six guests in the 45 minute podcast and I was out and about with them on the, as they were doing the marathon and the half marathon in the grasslands, trying to capture that sound and them and all the atmosphere. And yeah, that was quite a challenge, but as well as recording that podcast and two more with two incredible conservationists out there, I didn't realize, but the whole program involved included Tusk taking us to see projects. So we went to meet ladies who are doing their beading, but now thanks to charities like Tusk, they've become entrepreneurs and they're selling their beadwork all over the world and therefore helping fund their village and their their children. We saw people living in mud huts who are using cow dung for heating. We did a, a canopy walk. Uh, we, we met so many local people and we were literally there for three days and also for me on a personal note I'd never seen wild animals in the wild and it was I found the whole experience humbling and breathtaking I saw white rhino black rhino hippos elephants a male uh, lion uh, which was just incredible who walked so close to our vehicle so yeah and then came, but came back on my SD card with three podcasts just praying the whole way home on the airplane that it had actually recorded right and I hadn't mess, <laughs> messed up my files you didn't just go on a on a safari trip <laughs> no I didn't and every, they, I felt like I was surrounded by such a lovely team because they were so aware of how focused I had to be that you know, when I was just doing little sort of box pops or, you know, just before the race, you know, how are you feeling? And I was just doing little tiny sound bites with people. They knew that my heart was in my mouth thinking, I really hope this is recording properly and that the sound's mm. good quality enough. But there are opportunities sometimes to to go abroad. And again, Convex, you know, it's pretty much blank sheet of paper and we discuss ideas together and we're very much on the same page with what we want to achieve and who we want to feature. And they're very open-minded, which is brilliant. You know, you couldn't wish for any anybody better to work for on that front. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you've just done so many incredible episodes, whether it's, you know, working with Tusk uh, and conservation in, in Africa and Kenya and you know what, or James Bond, <laughs> literally. The <laughs> I think you're a James Bond the, fan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am too. I really am you know, the art director of the last five James Bond films, that's huge. And also getting the rights to that music for the episode, just incredible. I mean, you've also, you know, worked on several charity and nonprofit episodes as well, whether it's about Alzheimer's research that Convex is heavily invested in, or, you know, Haircuts for Homeless and their founder, Stuart Roberts, MBE. So, you know, there, there's a lot of really incredible stories that you guys are telling. Stuart was an Instagram find, actually. I just saw him. He flicked up. I think he flicked up on my feed because Vicky McClure, the actress, follows Haircuts for Homeless, and I follow her. And you know how the algorithms work sometimes. Yep. So I think he popped up on my feed because of that. And I just started looking at his. His pictures were quite eye-catching because a lot of them were in black and white. And he just brought out a book which had been taken by... Uh, a very eminent portrait photographer and they were black and white images of homeless people 
before and after their haircuts. And it was a coffee table book to raise funds for haircuts for homeless. So I just started reading a bit more about it. And then I realized that Stuart had been a hairdresser for many years and his life wasn't without, you know, it, it, it struggles. He hasn't had an easy life. And one day just really disturbed by how many people sleep rough on the streets in Britain, he thought that perhaps it would be nice to offer a few homeless people a haircut because nobody, as he says, lays hands on these people. They don't really have much human interaction. Many of us are guilty of it sometimes. Sometimes when you haven't got a bit of loose change in your pocket and you know, you might pretend to be on your phone and walk past somebody or not give them eye contact or not even pass the time of day. And a lot of homeless people are invisible. And he thought that giving them a haircut might really help with self-esteem and make them feel better. So he just started doing a few himself. And now he's grown it into a network where across Britain, he has 600 hairdressers who give homeless people haircuts. So we went to a church in Knightsbridge, which is quite ironic because Knightsbridge is probably one of the most affluent areas of London. Yeah, it's very fancy. It's where Harrods department store is. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's where it's where Harrods is, it's where Harvey Nicks is, it's you know, it's where the houses are in them, or apartments are in their millions. And they're in this eighteen I think it's the church dated back to the eighteen hundreds in this beautiful, simple church called St. Columba on a night when another charity every Friday night offers homeless people a hot meal, Stuart sets up every six weeks. And whoever comes in, about 100 people come in for a, a warm meal, which is free. And then he's there in the corner, very low key with two or three other hairdressers and his sister who helps him with the charity. And people just know that if they want a haircut and a chat, they can come over. And so I started talking to Stuart and he said, look, why don't you come to the church one Friday night and see how it all works? And it was a magical atmosphere. And the difference you could see when people sit in his chair and their shoulders go down and, and somebody just listens to them and asks how they are or how was that? How was your day? That was probably one of my favorites to, to record. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many amazing episodes. We'll have the link here in the show notes. And that was kind of the next question that I was trying to get out. How do you decide which stories to tell? Like how, how does that come about? I, I mean, it sounds like, especially from this one with Stuart, from the episode that you did with Haircuts for Homeless, it's almost like in some ways the stories find you. <laughs> I think that's a good way of saying it. I think the stories do find me really. I, I'm very aware of what's happening news wise i read a lot of magazines i'm i'm on social media a lot so sometimes i find interesting people through instagram often it's word of mouth and and also it's it's my contacts that i've had for many years as as well sometimes it's just a, a funny one we have a singer here i don't know how extensively she's known across the world but sophie ellis bexter very famous singer in britain and for months, I, I go every morning for my little takeaway coffee at my little coffee shop, um, Good Boy, and I sit outside, come rain or shine, and just set my day, get my notebook out, my diary, work out what I'm up to. And I'd been watching Sophie come in for weeks, and we kind of smiled each, at each other. I think there was a recognition that she probably thought, oh, I know her face from, I don't know, the one show or GMTV or something. So there was kind of like a recognition, but we'd never actually spoken. And obviously, I knew who she was because she's a fantastic singer. And then I just sent her a message, a direct message on Instagram. And I hope I don't sound like some kind of stalker, but I see you every morning in Good Boy. And, you know, this is my background and I'm doing a podcast. And would you do me the honor of, of recording one with me? And, you know, bear in mind how big she is here. She replied immediately saying, here's my mobile. Just WhatsApp me. Yeah, let's get some takeaway coffee and record one in the park. And she was very famous here in lockdown for her kitchen disco. So, She's a pop singer and um, very sparkly and glittery and fun. And in lockdown, she decided that she needed to, you know, boost the boost the nation and provide a bit of glitter in our lives. And so she did kitchen discos live from her kitchen and then ended up doing a, a program based on them for Radio 2 and then raising a million pounds when she disco danced for 24 hours for children in need. 
And she just said yes straight away. And she has her own podcast called Spinning Plates, which is very good. And the only caveat is it features women who are mums. And it's all about, it's not really a parenting podcast. It's all about, you know, how as busy working mums, we keep all those sp- plates spinning in the air. And she does a load of different people. And I saw, I was so nervous thinking, oh, you know, you might not reply or you'd never see my message. And she said, oh, I go through that too. And it just made me sort of smile that there she is, Sophie Ellis Baxter, massively known in Britain. And she goes through the same kind of pain points as I do sometimes where I think, oh, I hope they get my message or I hope they see that. Because sometimes it is as simple as a little direct message. There was a a yeoman of the warder, a beef eater from the Tower of London who guarded the Queen when she was lying in state. And I watched his story unfold on Instagram and I sent him a little direct message. And he sent me a message a few days later saying, oh, it's usually nutters that message me, but I've Googled you and realized you're not a nutter. (laughs) Yes, I'd love to do your podcast. So sometimes it sort of comes about like that. And then other times they're contacts. So another great one was the UN patron of the oceans and Arctic swimmer, Lewis Pugh, who'd spoken at a conference I'd hosted about how for the last 30 years, he's donned a pair of Speedos and a swimming hat and no grease or anything like that and swum the most dangerous Arctic waters to highlight climate change. And he's sad that 30 years on, he's still doing it, still having to put his life at risk, aged 50 odd now, to try and make people listen, you know, that the ice caps are melting so quickly and that we really are in a climate emergency. So sometimes it's people I've worked with in the past or people I know or or new people I meet recommend other people. Or my blind friend, for example, Amma, who I mentioned at the beginning, He did an event a few months ago uh, and he said, oh, I had to Google this guy, but I was with a chap called Alan Scott and he's a very, very well-known screenwriter. But he said, what I found fascinating was he spent 30 years trying to get the Queen's Gambit made and he bought the rights to the Queen's Gambit to Alan Tevis's book back in 1985 and he knew it was a cracking story and he spent on and off. 30 years trying to make film studios to persuade them to make it and eventually as you'll know it ended up as a I think it was seven or eight part series on Netflix and broke all Netflix records with at the time 64 million households tuning in so he saw I, I asked him if he'd do your podcast and he says yes well he did incredible films in the 60s and 70s and um, you know, is is a really eminent writer. And the next thing I knew, thanks to Amor, I find myself in his office talking about the Queen's Gambit. And we focused the whole podcast on that story because it was, or mainly on that story because it was so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's really a combination, right? And I love what you said about messaging people on Instagram, like, <laughs> oh no, are they going to respond? <laughs> Not to backtrack, but like that kind of, you know, imposter syndrome affects everyone. Like whether you, I mean, very, very few people I, I've ever met are like, oh yeah, I don't feel weird about that. But I think everybody on some level, you know, if you're approaching a stranger, if you're cold approaching, it's definitely something where, you know, there there is that hesitation like, oh, are they going to say yes? Are they going to reply? But it's worth asking because they could say yes. And a lot of the time they do. It's definitely worth asking. I think we're doing, Chris Levine is an an artist who, uh, I don't know if you remember, but when the Queen died, there were images. Well, I think they were all over the world and on the front pages of magazines. There was an iconic image of her with her eyes closed, which was taken about 10 years ago. And it was taken by light artist Chris Levine. And I didn't realize they'd been taken 10 years ago, but I saw them all over London on tube walls and bus shelters and the front cover. I think he was front cover of Time magazine. And again, I looked him up on Instagram and he was only the second photographer in the world to take an official photograph of the Dalai Lama, for example. And he's an incredible light artist. And the approach to him was a direct message on Instagram. And he replied straight away saying, you know, I don't be honored to be featured. Here's my assistant's name and invited us to his little studio in Mayfair later this week, actually. So a lot of them do come about through that. Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to slide into the DMs. Yeah, absolutely. No, slip into a DM. I mean, that's the wonderful thing, isn't it, about socials that we can really get hold of anybody we want these days. Yeah. And there is a way to do it though, because 
I mean, honestly, Helen, you've, you've had, you know, just so much experience in terms of being a journalist and are there any tips you have for approaching guests? You know, do you say like, Hey, this is my podcast. Here's some episodes. Do you, I mean, what's, what's in that little initial message? Yeah, I just say that I, I, I'm a host of the Convex Conversation. I, I always say I'm a broadcaster, you know, and I put, I put in brackets, you know, X, Sky News, GMTV, The One Show, wh- whatever, all the places I've mm-hmm. worked for that people might recognize. Not that they'd ne- not necessarily remember me, but there'll be a familiarity, and I think that gives you a bit of credibility. Right. I think it does add to credibility. Absolutely. Yeah. And also then I think people then Google you. And if you Google me, all sorts of, all sorts of nonsense right. from those days comes <laughs> the up. The internet is a big place. <laughs> yeah, it is. And and I will say then I, I send a link. I send a link to the the um, podcast. But what I also do is I send a, often send a, an image that we made up, which is just a square image made up of 16 photographs of guests with the the quote that we always put along the, the bottom of each lead image on the podcast and it's it's I just call it my at a glance to give you an idea and it's just an at a glance actually we need to do a new one because the one that I use is pretty old but it's an at a glance of the company you'll be sitting in to try and make people realize that it's credible and and it's good quality and it's going to be a nice ride and the messages are just they're just warm you know just just yeah. friendly and warm and, and hoping that they'll they'll take part and we really I can't even re- really remember anybody actually saying no so we've been really really lucky on that front that yeah you know, and I also say I just need you know an hour of your time and I think when you mm. you know some podcasts take two and a half hours to record or whatever I think when you were specific, were quite specific about the actual record will be about 45 minutes and you know, if you include a bit of setup time, you know, if you can spare an hour of your time, then I think that helps as well. And willing to go to them, depending on um, where they are, obviously, mind yeah. you. <laughs> I like travels. So it doesn't really bother me where they are. <laughs> I'm always yeah. game to jump on a plane, I suppose, or a car or whatever. Absolutely. Those are some really great tips. I mean, I think also, you know, saying, hey, you know, this is my credibility, you know, whether you're a journalist or whether, you know, other projects you've worked on even as a podcaster or other shows that you um, have contributed to or anything like that. That's number one. Number two, other guests that you've had that are similar, that have similar audiences or similar followings. Fantastic. Number three, you know, this is how much of your time it's going to take. Here's the commitment, right? And then number four, I'll come to you. How easy can I make it, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> and then offer. You can offer a per- an in an in person or a virtual record. Some people do prefer um, a virtual one. Um, I interviewed somebody who only lives sort of kind of around the corner the other day, but we did that. He preferred to do it virtually, and I think it's quicker virtually. I think. Mm, um, because when absolutely. you do turn up at somebody's house or office or meet, it does tend to be a bit longer because you do have a coffee and chat and faff a bit. And so I think I think the quicker one is the virtual record. And it's given me some wonderful just life experiences. Only this week I interviewed the Yeoman Warder from the Tower of London. Now, the Tower of London is one of my favorite historical well, it's a royal palace, actually. But, you know, I remember going there as a child and being fascinated by all the history, all the gruesome history and the, you know, the beheading of Anne Boleyn and the hang drawing and quartering of Guy Fawkes and just a just thousand years of history and that it still looks the same as it did back in William the Conqueror's day. And so the Yeoman Warder interview was going to be on the Saturday morning. And he said, look, hey, why don't you come on Friday night and you can witness the ceremony of the keys now i'm perhaps a bit naive but i'd never even heard of the ceremony of the keys no me neither i'm american though helen so i don't know (laughs) well you need to come to the tower of london because every night for the last 700 years even during the blitz in world war ii when a bomb dropped on the tower of london the ceremony of the keys has taken place and it's a it's a ceremonial it's a locking of the Tower of London with now the King's Keys. It was the Queen's Keys, obviously, for for 70 years. But now the keys belong to King Charles III. And it's done with, we witnessed it with the Irish guards who are armed and the head beef eater and, and the yeoman of the warder that I was featuring. And it's all, you see them say, an armed soldier points his rifle and he says, who goes there in a very aggressive 
voice and the the yeoman warder says the keys and he says whose keys and he said the king's keys and then he says something like you may pass and they play the last post and it's just incredible and none of that could be filmed or recorded audio wise because they like to keep a little bit of magic to the ceremony of the keys so there were five fifty people members of the public allowed to witness it it was 10 o'clock at night they wait 18 months to, on the list to go and see it. And I was lucky. I took my son, Jack, who's only 13, mm. and he just came away and he said, but we've just seen something that hardly anybody sees. And there's an 18 month waiting list, mom. And I said, I know, but that's one of the beauties of my job in journalism. I think, you know, I've had a front row seat to so many different events and things in life from, I don't know, an execution I witnessed in America to sadly the coming down of the Twin Towers on September the 11th, which I witnessed from my apartment in the fire escape of my apartment in New York and then covered that story for ITV for the next year to whatever it might be. I've been very, very blessed. And I can honestly tell you that I don't really feel like I've worked a, a day in my life. I think it's been such an interesting journey so far and continues to be interesting that you know, I just, just wouldn't, I just feel very, very blessed and, and really, really lucky. And to a certain extent, you can make some of your own luck as well. And I think the podcast, if it, if it lights me up, then I think it's going to light up our, our listeners. And I hope that's the case. Oh, absolutely. Well, Helen, it's been just such a treat to have you here on the podcast. And I think some of those tips for our listeners are just so incredible, along with, you know, the stories and the incredible work that you're doing at the Convex Conversation. And I just want to end with the fact that you guys just recently won an International Women's Podcast Award. We had Naomi Mella on the podcast who created the awards, and um, it's just really incredible. So congratulations on that as well. Really fantastic. Oh, thank you. We've never entered anything before and we were shortlisted in two categories and we won for the podcast actually with Amal Latif, the blind entrepreneur. It was yes. in the category, I think, of of entrepreneurial inspiration. And believe me, you, you go a long way to find somebody as as inspiring as that on the entrepreneurial front. He set up his own travel company for blind and sighted travelers because he was fed up of tour companies insisting he had to take a carer with him. He said, I don't need a carer. I'm blind. I don't need a carer. And so he set up the world's first. And the deal is that you get a bit of discount if you're sighted, but you are willing to describe and you know, help a, a partially sighted or, or blind traveler. And uh, believe me, having traveled with Amma, I've climbed a mountain with Amma and done all sorts of things, you get a lot out of that if you're sighted. So uh, we were so honored to win Naomi's award. And it was it was a really special moment. I, the night of the awards, I was actually hosting a rail event across town. And yeah. the people who organized the rail event, who I work with a lot, and who are big fans of the podcast, as is Amma, he always listens to every new episode, just said, look, I know you're supposed to be hosting this black tie dinner, but just nip in a taxi and and go to the awards. And they were laughing and saying, but don't come back unless you've won one. And I went back <laughs> about an hour later with this beautiful glass, heavy a trophy. I don't know what you call it, but it was a I don't, it's not really a trophy. It was a piece of glass with the podcast award on it, which yeah. I think is pride of place somewhere at Convex. So, um, yeah, that meant, you know, meant a lot, actually. I've never won anything in my life. And we were up against some really fantastic podcasts and some extraordinary names. So we really genuinely were just happy to be shortlisted. And it sort of blew me away a bit that we we won one. So, um, yeah, very, very nice way to end 2022. And uh, it set our, set our bar high for 2023. Absolutely. Well, we're so excited about what's to come for the Convex Conversation. And um, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Podcasting Smarter. If you have any podcasting questions or want to get in touch, send us an email at podcastingsmarter at podbean.com. Thanks so much and happy podcasting.